In this video I describe a method of fractional distillation to separate the more volatile products of fermentation from the alcohol and water that make up an azeotropic mixture resulting from column distillation of fermented wash. From batch distillation, the first couple of percent of distillate are discarded as four shots to prevent methanol poisoning. The distillation method in this video will separate methanol from ethanol throughout the process, as is used in commercial distillery operations. In those operations, four shots are not discarded from the beginning of the run. They are taken off the top of the column throughout the run. In principle I could do the same here, but to do so will require some additional safety engineering. To get this to work requires precise control of heater power, which is adjusted in response to the output from the column. Before the column is properly adjusted, i.e. at the beginning of a batch distillation run, the separation of these products cannot be guaranteed, so I will still discard four shots in the normal way. Commercial operations that use similar fractional distillation run continuous stills, and these provide an added layer of safety against methanol poisoning. Batch distillation concentrates the methanol from a large volume of wash at the beginning of the distillation process, which is what makes it dangerous. In continuous distillation, methanol is spread throughout the run. Methanol and other small molecules like acetone are not pleasant and cause a nasty hangover even in otherwise safe concentrations. The motivation for running a still like this is to eliminate them altogether to improve the quality of the product. In prior videos, I looked at fractional distillation to the azeotropic point. When doing that with a batch distillation, the resulting azeotropic product smells and when diluted tastes slightly off in the early part of the run, after the four shots have been thrown. What chemicals are responsible for these effects I'm not sure, other than acetone and methanol, but there are various recognisable smells and tastes. There is a bitter taste you feel at the back of the tongue, there is a nasty pig's bottom smell, which is detected early in the run, and there is also an industrial waste antiseptic cleaning fluid smell, which appears thereafter. It's not until you get about two-thirds to three-quarters of the way through the run that you get a clean, pure vodka taste. I never get the tails or earthier sort of taste that you get with pot distillation, as they do not get over the aseotropic distillation column if it is adjusted correctly. So, from a simple azeotropic column, we only have a usable yield of perhaps 25% of our distillate, hence the need for another system. The problem is that however carefully we adjust the still heater to find that azeotropic point, what we're collecting is all of the vapour phase and anything more volatile than alcohol will be collected with it. We need to change to a true fractional column. That means drawing an azeotropic mixture from the column as a liquid rather than as a vapour and letting the vapour of the lighter chemicals escape to be discarded. The fractional column is extended above the draw point and this extension only needs to be thin as these lighter chemicals are scarce. Their scarcity means that there's little vapour going above the draw point and little heat transfer to the column extension, so it will tend to run cool. We want its top to run at a temperature comfortably above the boiling point of methanol of 64.7 degrees centigrade and below that of the water ethanol azeotrope of 78.1 degrees. There are now two parameters that we need to control, the product proof and the column extension temperature. I have not been able to do this with a single control parameter of heater power. I tried with variable column extension insulation and with a second isothermal deflegmator, but in both cases the extension ran too cool. There just is not enough vapour more volatile than ethanol to keep it hot, so instead I used a thermostatic heating system that works and allows the temperature to be set reliably. This is a side elevation of a midsection through the top of the resulting still column. Above the main packing is an open area where vapour condenses on the column walls and drips down from the column extension above. The two collection plates are sheets of copper made from flattened copper tubing arranged so that any liquid falling onto the upper plate is directed to fall onto the lower one while allowing vapour to pass between the two. I've added a YouTube to prevent vapour from escaping with the product. 
I guessed how deep it should be, and three centimetres works fine. The pressure inside the top of the column is very close to atmospheric. The column extension is a piece of 15mm copper pipe filled with spiral prismatic packing. It's heated by a water jacket that is thermostatically controlled with a temperature sensor at the top and a band heater at the bottom. I used a water jacket because I started with an isothermal deflagmator that I repurposed, making this the easiest option, but the jacket is probably not necessary. There is a gap between the bottom of the heating water jacket and the top of the column proper to allow for a gradual temperature gradient between the two. The head's vapour exit pathway is angled downwards so that any condensation that occurs in this tube flows out of the column. Here is a photograph of the real thing. I used low power 12 volt silicon pad heaters and one at 15 watts was not quite enough so I added a second at 20 watts totalling 35 watts which was fine. This system requires no additional condenser. The head's vapour outflow pipe at the top is a piece of 8mm copper tubing that's about a metre long and acts as an air-cooled condenser. As the product is drawn off as liquid, no condensation is required. However, I cooled it with a Liebig condenser to bring it down to a constant temperature to allow easier reading of a Parrot hydrometer. As we're interested in alcohol concentrations to within a tenth of a percent, temperature correction to one degree accuracy is required, and this is a lot easier with a fairly constant temperature in the Parrot. Aside from that issue of convenience, it works fine with no additional condensation system. This system works well, producing a better, cleaner vodka than simply condensing all the vapour. Product quality remains consistent throughout the run, without the off-tastes of heads at the beginning. The temperature of the thermostatic heater needs to be comfortably above the boiling point of methanol of 64.7 degrees. Even below the boiling point of ethanol there will still be a substantial proportion of ethanol vapour in the head's outflow. It will just have a partial pressure lower than atmospheric, with the remainder being made up of a small amount of volatile chemicals like methanol and acetone and air. This means that the lower the temperature of the column extension, the less will be the ethanol that is lost in the heads. I found that at about 74 degrees centigrade, the ratio of product to heads is about 3 to 1. 70 degrees provided a fair choice to maintain vodka quality while minimising losses, giving a product to heads ratio of between 5 and 10 to 1. I haven't gone below around 68 degrees in order to keep a comfortable temperature buffer above the boiling point of methanol. Given the variations that occur because of atmospheric pressure and the imprecision of inexpensive electronic temperature sensors. This scheme produces the cleanest vodka I've managed so far using batch distillation. I'm still using a thin 28mm column which has a correspondingly low yield, producing about 100 mils per hour of product. The ability to remove methanol and other unwanted volatile chemicals from the product is a precursor to the conversion from batch to continuous distillation, and I turn to that matter in the next video.